again, see? And I cut meat, uh, and then I, uh, I get mad. Then I do something else, see? And I go cut meat again. And then I went up to, I want to be, I thought, you know, I was in a service, and I said, you know, I just wanted a little fishing boat, you know? I really like to get a little put, 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 put in my lobster traps or something, you know? I'll come in, you know, I'll get nice, they'll put the fjord or something. I like that, see? So I go up to a gun clip, Maine. I worked in the field. So I got a job on a fishing boat. See, well, that lasted about, uh, about five days. Like, no, I don't know. They were just pulling in nets and guts and blood and stink. There was no women waiting for me. There was no Old Spice, no beer, nothing. You know? well, I'm happy, you know? So I said, the hell with this. It's just basically why I don't need this. And so I thought, well, while I'm up here, I also want to be a lumberjack, you know? So I said, well, I'll get a job. So I got a job at the lumber company. So I want to be a lumberjack. So I did that for about a month. But, I, but you know, starting out as a, as a young lad, you're a bottom bunk person. And that means you not only sleep in the bottom bunk with everybody else's things hanging in your face and everything, huh? but you do all bottom bunk stuff, you know, the garbage, you clean the latrines. And I want to get on top of the trees, you know. I have to, I want to make them fall. I want to do those wonderful things, swing it back and forth, stand on a board, you know, so then, ah, the hell with this. So, and then all of then at night you fought. So well, I didn't mind the fighting bit, because that was okay. I was all right at that, but, you know, but then it was other stuff. So I said, the hell with this. So I went back down to New Jersey and cut meat again, see? And that reason I just had enough of it, so I went up to Canada, and I lived with Charlie with the Young Young Wits for a year, and run trap line with Charlie for a year, you know. And uh, a wonderful guy, he was like 78, you know, and uh, we'd go walking in the woods in snowshoes, you know. I'd be walking in snowshoes, you know, but boy, you got to know how to do it. I'd say, hey, Charlie, are you tired, you know? <laughs> so you're not tired, Charlie? said, no, a little further. I'd say, oh, good, Charlie. Oh, my God. No, he's not. And uh, a wonderful guy. Like, he's a guy, 78, no concept of dying, you know, none whatsoever, see. We walk along, and he used to make birch bark canoes and things or like that, you know. And uh, just one, and the only measurements he used was those things on his body, you know. I mean, just so many of these and so many of that. And he boiled cedar root, called Wattap, and he would sew the canoes with cedar root and things. You know? And a very minimal amount of pitch. I don't think he ever tried to portage a, a birch bark canoe, because some of them weighed 9,365 pounds, you know, about that much pitch. <laughs> These were light, relatively light, and they all were just... Boy, I just spray like that, beautiful, you know? And so, we would go in, and he would show me a stand of birch, you know? he say, now in about 30 years, you know, I'll make a canoe out of this, you know? I think he's 78, he's 108. He said, right, okay, no problem. And we go down there, and he said, now there's a calf and a cow with two bulls down here. Blah, 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 you know, and there they'd be, you know? I mean, he knew, he had, he had all that. I started to try to figure it out, you know? we go there by this, I'll never forget it, you know? Here's this log and a rock and a thing coming down here, and he brushes the snow away, and I pet a bear. You know? I mean, it's like he knew where everybody was, you know? He knew where everything is. He's expert. He had to be. And then it dawned on me, you know? No matter what you do, you've got to be expert, you know? You've got to be expert at what you're doing. You're going to get wiped. You know what I mean? You've got to know what you're doing. You have to have a lot of information about what you're doing. It's very important. Okay. So also learn that if you're doing what you want to do full time, you're going to do good because you want to do it. You know, why break your back at cutting meat that I really didn't want to do anymore? Because at this time, that was happening, so the chain stores were in. People didn't care about cooking. So you had, as a butcher at that time, you had to know about cooking. You had to, had to know, tell them how to make a nice glaze for the ham. You had to tell them how to cook it, how to prepare it, you know, how to put pocketed. You know, how many people knew how to cook a beef heart with chestnut dressing and roasted? You know, they didn't know about that stuff. So soak it in milk. So you had to know all that kind of stuff. So now, they didn't really care, just as long as it was packaged. So I didn't want to deal with that anymore kind of thing, see? So I went to try and learn that. The other thing I learned was that we're just here for a visit, you know, and we're supposed to enjoy it. Just think about that, you know, we're just here for a visit, at least in this thing. Whatever happens after this, I don't care, what, I do care, I don't know what happens after this thing, see? What, I know something's got to happen, I figure it that way, you know? Something's got to happen, and when that happens, I'll deal with it, you know? I mean, I'm feeling okay with this, and I'll deal with the next thing. Now, my wife, Paul, is in a little bit reverse. She's worried about what happens after uh, this death uh, situation and trying to deal with that now while she's alive. I'm thinking, how the hell can you deal when you don't know what is going to, you know, I just surprise, 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 you know? I mean, it's okay, see? But she's getting a lot out of it and everything. You know, she's speaking to little people and things. And I don't know. Great gal. Just a great gal. Love it. Love it. And uh, so I, I learned that, Charlie, so then I came down and cut meat again. And uh, because I said I couldn't spend my whole life up in the woods running away, but I didn't feel that was what, what it was about, you know. And so, you know, I even had an Indian name and everything, see. It was, it was really Omega Khan, it was called Beaver Bone, see. I mean, it was great. It was just like all these things I fantasized about when I was in school, sitting there trying to deal with school. I did them, everyone, you know. Not planning to do them, I just did them. Isn't that
that great? I mean, we can all do those things, you know? It's just, I don't know what else to be in love with, you know? I just don't know, you know? I mean, I haven't been that good a guy, you know? I've been pretty rotten for some times, you know? I don't know. It just worked that way, and I'm definitely appreciative of that. It has, you know? But anyhow, I think a lot of it has been, however, because I listened to Charlie, you know, and figured out this thing of being here for a visit, you know, and being an expert about what you're doing, you know. That just means having a lot of knowledge about what you're doing, you know. And if you like what you're doing, and if you believe in it and yourself, boy, nobody can stop you. There's nobody can stop you, you know. I mean, how, see, I firmly believe, you know, that I can be or do anything, anything, if I want to do it bad enough, you know? And I think, I really mean it, you know? It seems to me, if we're not doing what we want to do, we just didn't want it bad enough, that's all, you know? I think that if you want something bad enough, you'll do it, you know? And you'll get around to doing it, but you got to want it bad enough. That's all there is to it, you know? I really think that. I think that's true. Sometimes, you got to make some pretty tough decisions, you know? And your life. <laughs> Actually, when you get right down to it, how many real, I mean, really tough decisions do you make? Maybe two or three in your whole life, probably. Really biggies, you know? Like getting married and divorced is the two biggies, first of all, right? <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, I don't sound stereo. I don't mean to make light of that at all. I don't mean that at all. They are big decisions, you know? They're big decisions. They really are. So, anyhow, I come down from the woods, you know, back to cutting meat. And, uh, Johanna, my first wife, there's Sloppo, my first wife and I, we, got, we decided to get married. You know, we used to, you know, we were raised together kind of in school and all that kind of business. You know, at that time, nobody went with anybody, you know. I mean, if you had a steady girl or a steady boyfriend, you're kind of dumb, you know, because everybody just goes with everybody. It's just great. Had a real nice relationship everybody did, you know. So I said, well, when I came back, we started to go out. We went out for about a month. I thought, might as well get married. Said, all right. So we got married, and all of a sudden, I have responsibility, you know. There's no more taking off, you know. We're just, <laughs> now, oh, wow, what's, what's happening here, see? You know? And it was okay, because it was good, you know, except the meat market was getting in the way. I was cutting meat because I had responsibility. Now, I was a little afraid to take chances now, because I was, you know, so the meat market was a very safe thing to be. We had a track home, you know. We had um, bowling on Friday nights, played poker, and then, you know. Da 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 da. Very boring life, actually. You know, it's very monotonous, and I really don't like that monotony uh, in life. And so I'm trying to deal with it. So I went back to drinking. <laughs> Basically, not the best way to do it. Public school forced me. The service would enforce me. But as a young person, you're trying to prove all those things that we think we have to prove. You know, we don't have to prove that we can cry and things as a male. You know, you do that alone. You know, but you have to prove in front of everybody that you're macho, that you can do all these other things: drink, get drunk, sick. All those things. See? So you have to do that, you know. So you do that, you know. So I learned how to do that really good in the service. I really did that good, you know. And so then public school, I started to relearn this again. Public school kind of drove me back and drinking. So now the meat market was taking me. And but I was always ever since school, I get three A's in school, gym shop and art, see? The rest of stuff. However, I did realize that all after years I realized that during the time I was in school, like World War II was on, you know. I was in a meat market, see? So I had all the ration stamps, I had all the coffee, I had all the meat, all the butter, nylons, the baby hats, whatever. See, so nobody could fail me. They would be foolish to fail me, you know? <laughs> right? That's right, see? And I really didn't realize how big a hammer I had. If I would have bought out, I really, really melted it. Maybe it would have got me off to a bad start in life, probably, see? But when I came back, and I, oh, I'm getting my story confused with this, right? But when I... And anyway, just let me finish this one part, okay? I'll just do it. Anyhow, because it's, it's important what happens, right? So I we get married and we're doing this. And so I'm painting. I was always painting and drawing, sketching in a service. You know, I was always painting. We're painting pictures of the people, the guys, the wives who had babies, and sending pictures, painting pictures of their babies. And I was making chip boxes and carvings and that. We'd paint lewd up, seeing things on torpedoes and bombs and, you know, these sayings and everything, Donald Ducks and stuff. I was like, yeah, things like that. And then, uh, uh, I was always dealing in art, in other words, that way, you know, expressing myself that way. So, uh, but I never thought I could be an artist, you know. That was always something else somebody else would be, you know. Like the artist wasn't something I could just be, because it had nothing to do with the work ethic, you know. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with being an artist, with something different, see. And so finally, 
I was, I, would, I went back, I was painting and cutting meat and drinking a lot because I was painting in the bars, you know. I'd paint pheasants flying over the John doors, you know, and behind the bar, big fish, or big bear scooping fish out, things which I knew about. I had a lot of information about bear, deer, fish. I fished every day of my life, see, you know, when I was a kid. Every day, eel fish, anything can do it. So I was paying that information that I knew the best and drinking a great deal, you know. I figured this cannot continue. And I was going to buy the meat market. Now, this, this plan, I just want to tell you this one thing. I was going to buy the meat market two days from the time I'm going to tell you about, okay? So it's really getting to me, you know. And I'm finding that. I'm saying, Jesus, you know, I'm going to go on to the great divide and not do what I want to do. Because my biggest fright was that I would die saying, I wish I would have. You know, I don't want to, I don't, I want to go out saying, I wish I would have, you know. I want to go out saying, hey, you know, it's been all right. You know, whatever. You know, that'd be okay. So, um, uh, anyhow, there was one lady who I used to deal with. Her name was Mrs. Hosier, see? And Mrs. Hosier was really a fanatic, just a real bitch, you know, real pain, real... Uh, I, I felt sorry for her sometimes. You know, she was a psychological battle for me, you know? Like, what I would do, you know, what I would do, I would cut a roast, see? I knew what she wanted. She wanted to eye it around, because there's no bone, no waste, no funny taste, just heat it, you can't beat it, it's just right away, eye it around. She wanted. So I would cut that in the morning, I'd put it in the ice box, see? The re re so I said that, uh, refrigerator, you know, walk in ice box. And then she would come in, usually around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, she would come in, see? And she, and she used to call me, the other thing I like about it, she used to call me Donald, you know? And the other Donald I know is Duck, see? So you know, Donald, you know? So she called me Donald. And she always had important guests coming. I don't think she ever had important guests coming, but you kind of do that so you get a better piece of meat or something, I think, something like that, you know? So now, Donald, I have company coming, and I need a roast. And I said, Oh, all right. And I would take a couple out of the showcase, sure. She said, no, no, no. That's not what I like. Now, Donald, I said, oh, wait a minute. I got to wait. Just a minute. I got one saved for Mrs. Albany. It's just a minute. So I go back and get the roast I cut in the morning for her. By this time, it's nice and red now and everything. I bring it back now. I said, she says, now that's what I really want. Now I said, look, don't tell Rosie. I'll cut her another one. Just, this is fine. See, then I said, why am I doing this? Why am I getting paid the money to be a psychiatrist? I don't understand it. I don't even know about it. See, why am I doing this? See? So, so this one Monday morning, and two days from this time, I'm telling you about now, I was going to buy the other half of the meat market and be a meat cutter forever and ever and ever and ever. You know, right? Mainly because of security, which was required of me in the family situation now, you know? So, I, uh, Monday morning, and usually Sunday nights or Saturday, Sunday nights, you didn't work. So Sunday you went out and got bombos, you know? Monday you come in really white. And so it was soup day, you know? Everybody wanted soup greens and piece of soup. Right? So she comes in. Monday morning, you know, and Miss Hoyer, she says, Donald, she says, I would like some ground chuck. I said, okay. So I take a piece of chuck out of the case and start taking the chime out. She says, how much is that, Donald? I said, that's 79 a pound. That time it was 79 a pound, boneless chuck. And she says, well, you have 59 in a case. I said, well, with the bone in, it's 59. With a bone out, it's 79, see? She said, well, why is that? I said, well, it's because I got to buy the bone. You buy the bone. Everybody buys a little bone. We slice it up. Fancy, so everybody gets a little piece of bone. <laughs> You know, it's the way it goes. And I'm getting really, really irritated, see? And so she said, well, I don't understand it. I said, you know, see, because the cows, they come with bones in them, see? <laughs> this time I'm really going to miss, see? So I have the knife in my hand, you know? I said, don't you understand that? And I'm really losing my cool. I walk out and I says, the cows has got bones. They're born with bones. If they didn't have bones, they'd all be laying out flat. <laughs>
go to school. We just get married. Of course, when you get married, you used to have all these trappings, you know, all the furniture, all the bills. You get right trapped.